We have an entire hour right now dedicated to Aaron Rodgers. What's he going to do next? I'm kidding. Oh, my God. I would die. Run it back. Starts now. Run it up to run it back. Yeah. Run it up to run it back. Run it up. Good Wednesday it morning. It this is yeah, Run It Back. Seriously, guys, what if we had to talk about Aaron Rodgers for the next hour? What would y'all do? <laughs> I would uh, take my mic off and go. <laughs> Honestly, right, I'd, probably, I'd probably order a jersey. I'd become a Jets fan. You're the worst. You know what? This is all on brand. Shams, would you be prof- Shams would be professional. This is all very much I, what I everybody did. <laughs> I would definitely be professional, but I feel like Chandler knows. You know, I feel like if we just let Chandler talk for the next hour, he'll break down the whole hey. thing for us right now. He knows what's up. Oh, you relate to the diva, cool. Chandler? That's that's a lot of psychology. I, I don't kiss and tell. Tune in to the show. Tune into the oh, magazine yeah. show. No, it's today's Fandu the day. I, today is definitely the day. Definitely walk in. By the way, if you're just joining us for the first time, I would like to introduce Stadium Insider Sham Sharadia, Chandler P, who would buy the jersey just like that. And Eddie G, who's actually <laughs> in the area in which Aaron Rodgers reportedly will be playing this season. Um, crazy times. This is Run It Back. Let's talk some hoops, shall we? Thank you. And we had some games. We had some games. Bucks beating the Suns 116 104. It's their 50th win. First of 50. Uh, Giannis with 36, 11, and 8. Now, Monty Williams was not happy about the fact that Giannis had 24 free throws last night, and Booker had three. Here he is. He got three free throws, and Drew Holiday is one of the most physical defenders in the game. He got he has three. Giannis has 24 free throws. It's ridiculous. There's no other way to put it. It's just our guys are fight. Da can't play. You know when a guy just runs into you the whole game, it's like we've dealt with this so many times um, with this team. And credit to him, he, he saw the way the game was being called. He kept doing it, but. That's hard to swallow when one guy had, and this has happened a number of times when we played them. That does seem like simple math to me, Chandler. Uh, is Monty right? Does he have a point? It's definitely frustrating because you, you, there's no way, real way to guard Giannis because when you give him that separation because he cannot shoot from the outside, he gets that full steam ahead, and that's when it allows him to kind of come at you. And the way the rules are now, you, you can't really you can't really touch him. You can't really hit him, and he's creating all the contact, yet he's still getting the whistle. But to compare him and Devin Booker's you know, physicality, it doesn't really make sense. Devin's not really that kind of guy initiating contact. He's more of a pull-up, ISO, get to his mid-range, face-up kind of guy. So they don't really have a guy that's attacking like this downhill so quick, like Giannis every play. But yeah, when, when you get an early whistle, like if you're DeAndre Ayton, that kind of changes the whole format of the game, how you can guard him. And it's tough because again, he does create this. He legitimately gets that full steam ahead and he runs into you. He gives a little head nod and the refs usually bite on that. And there is contact, but it's not really fair because he is creating that and he is basically running in if some they, the best bet is just to take a charge on him because you can't really wrap him up you can't you can't swipe down the minute you swipe down and hit any part of his arm with the James Harden rule that's a foul so it is tough but also they, they could they could throw different guys at him they could guard him differently they almost got to play him as a shooter so he can't get that downhill speed going at him but this is what makes him great. He's he's kind of unguardable. He, he can't shoot, so you think he could just play off of him, but really that makes things worse. Eddie's thinking. Yeah, I, I I get what Monty Williams is going for. I hate to blame the refs for any loss. Like you still had to go out there and play the game. They had a shot to win. They they were close into the fourth quarter, and then things devolved from there. But it is frustrating. I I see how it's frustrating because. He's getting every bump on one side, and I'm watching Book get bumped. Not Chandler's right, not to the same level of physicality, but you're talking about the same type of bumps on drives, and he's not getting the same type of calls. So it's the inconsistency that would bother me as a member of that team or the coaching staff, and I that's where I understand where Monty goes to the podium and complains a little bit. But it's not Giannis's fault. Like, he is getting fouled. He is... His physicality is forcing the defenders to make a decision. The second half, they went with Ish Wainwright, who, if you don't know, is quite literally a football player. He played college football and transitioned to basketball in the pros. And so he tried to get as physical with Giannis as he could. But Giannis is a specimen. Like Giannis, he plays physical. He fights through that, through, through, the, through the hacks, through the bumps. And he, he kind of 
thrives on that. And and look, he had a tough night at the free throw line, by the way. So it's not like he completely took advantage of it. But yes, he he is exploiting the refs a little bit in a sense. And I do think there was a little bit of lack of consistency of the calls on both ends. But it's not Giannis's fault. Like he took advantage of it and, and they won the game. The problem for the Bucks is, and what they need to look at is. They really don't have a body to guard him. Not that any team in the league has a body for Giannis, but they don't have that answer for him, whether it's they wall up. They they tried uh, Bismack Biombo, That wasn't working. And like I said, they, eventually they went with Ish Wainwright, and he struggled as well. He was able to match him kind of strength for strength, but can't stay in front of him, can't guard him. They have to figure out their Giannis strategy if they're looking to see them in the playoffs, and they want to. They want to get to the finals, and I bet that's the team they want to play because they lost to them a couple years ago. But... I get what Monty's saying, but, you know, them's, those are the breaks. Them's the breaks. I feel like Monty was just having flashbacks, though, right? Like, of two years <laughs> ago when Giannis was doing this on a <laughs> nightly basis. I mean, th that last game when, when they clinched, I mean, he had, like, what, 50 and 20. The games that he was putting up in the finals, I mean, I was there. He was manhandling that team. I mean, he manhandles really any team, the way he's able to get to the paint, how physical he is. That's, a, that's why he's probably the most difficult player to officiate, just because of how much contact he creates. You know, at 6'10", 6'11", he kind of plays like Shaq, but he's able to be at, on the perimeter as well. But when, when you look at this team, I mean, he has 36, 11, and 8. He leaves 10 points at the free throw line, like Eddie said. This Bucks team is 21-2 and two in the last 23 games. Hmm. They got off to an up-and-down start, but they were hanging around, hanging around 2-seed, two, 3-seed, two 4-seed. And now you look up, they're going to end up being the number one seed unless they literally let go of the rope. Uh, here in the last three weeks of the season. And I think what Giannis is doing, what this team is doing, they're clearly on upward trajectory. So I don't know anything about buying stock. I don't know anything about, about that. But like the Bucks are the team right now, to me, in, in the Eastern Conference. Yes, Boston is going to be there. I think Philly's going to give them, a, you know, could give them a, a tough battle as well. And you have to think Cleveland, uh, you know, you never know. They can make any series difficult. But to me, Milwaukee uh, has separated itself. No, I need there to be some more challenge. Come on. <laughs> All right, listen, Sean. There will be challenge. I'm just. I just see those odds plus 290 for the Bucks to win a championship. I legitimately might take that bet right after the commercial break because they are. <laughs> They're so deep, bro. Like, they're, the Chris Middleton's out. Doesn't matter. Pat Connelton's in. Grayson Allen's out. Joe Ingles' minutes go up and they play. Like, they are so good. Greg Anthony said something last night. Like, they beat you even at your own game, like, when they're when they're hurt. Like, it's true. They can beat you defensively. They can beat you offensively. They can beat you getting to the free throw line. They can beat you shooting the three ball. Like, there's nothing this team can't do. So, when you see that, those odds right there, Listen, I've been wrong a lot this year. Mm -hmm, that is mm -hmm. really good. <laughs> that is a really good value to get this team who's peaking at the right moment. The Western Conference is kind of a mess. So I think whoever wins the East is coming out of everything. Take the Milwaukee Bucks. I don't know how you know we what? got here. But my God. I don't know how we got here either, Chandler, but for you to admit how wrong you've been. That's growth, my friend, and I am Thank proud you. of you, very proud of you. Um, look, there's a moment last night where I draw the line, okay? Once your face gets messed with, this is not okay. Uh, Tory Craig loses this tooth, or a tooth, after that moment with Giannis there. This wasn't a foul, uh, Eddie. Do you, what, were you shocked at all? Ooh, yeah, wow. between this one and the uh, and the charge block in the uh, first half where he sent, he sent Tory Craig into the third row, uh, yeah, I was a little surprised. I know there was a little, oh, some God. debate, some people arguing with me on Twitter. You can't really see the elbow in the wide shot unless you know mm -hmm. what you're looking at. But he elbowed him right in the jaw. Like, it's, yep. it's incidental contact. It's his basketball play. It happens. But, yo, some fouls are on accident. That was a foul on accident. The craziest part to me is you can see in this shot right here, the ref There's is the right angle. there. The, 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 the ref is supposed to be looking at this stuff right here. Giannis didn't mean to elbow him, but, yo, and they said on the broadcast, it might have been his filling. And I feel like that's 100% worse to have your filling. It is? Like a hole in your tooth where your filling was supposed <sighs> to be. I don't know how he continued to play basketball after that. I would have been out for three months if my tooth got knocked out <laughs> like this. But I don't, I don't I know. Uh, NBA can go back and add like a tech or something. Like They need to, they need to rectify that situation. Yeah, yeah if you lose a part of your face, I think that's a foul. And usually at the next dead ball, they take a look at this, right? Even if it's inc incidental, even if it's accident, they still need to look at this. And I don't think it was on purpose. I do think the ref's angle maybe was hard because it was kind of slick. And as physical as Giannis was playing, 
this was probably one of the more least physical plays he had during the game. It just so happened to catch him at the right moment. But uh, yeah, I'm surprised it didn't at least go back, look at this and give him a flagrant or something. Although it wasn't on purpose, you still got to do something here. And especially how the game was being called every time that they touched him, it was a whistle. <laughs> and then he got away with a literally a tooth knockout elbow. Oh God. Uh, that's got to frustrate you. Yeah. I think the angle Jim from underneath Chandler. the basket was perfect. Chandler, have you ever lost a tooth on the court? I remember DeMarcus Cousins said he lost his front tooth multiple times. Jeremy Grant, when he was on Philly, when they were really bad, he got me one time really bad in my front tooth. And this one, uh, it's fake. It's fake? (laughs) My God, you're like a hockey player, Chandler. You can't teach You can't. Did you finish the game? Heavens, though. I was out for two weeks. (laughs) Oh. Perfect. Of course you were. <laughs> I don't even know how to keep going. It just, okay. said dental, it just said dental work for the next two weeks. For one tooth, Chandler? No, I'm kidding. Don't I'm they, kidding. <laughs> Wait, can you take it out or is it permanent? No, no, I think it's in there now. Oh, you need one of those cool ones that you can take it out at the bar. Okay, fine. We're getting distracted. Um, look, there, there was a, a, a nice moment, a fun moment, if you will, at the end of the game between Devin Booker. All right, third quarter, one-on-one with his uh, former teammate, Jay Crowder. It's the buzzer beater. There are words exchanged. I'm sure they were all awesome. And then there were also hugs exchanged afterwards. Shams, your reaction to seeing this this heartfelt moment? Yeah, I saw it in the moment. I saw a couple of tweets that were like, Jay Crowder, Devin Booker exchanged words. And then I look at the video and I'm like, yo, <laughs> it would surprise me because Jay Crowder was beloved in that locker room. Devin Booker loved him. Chris Paul loved him. So I watched the video and they're smiling. I think what Devin Booker was kind of saying, which is I'm sure he said it to Jay Crowder multiple times in practices, like you can't guard me, uh, you know, probably th- th- throwing in some some F words in there as well. Like you can't guard me. <laughs> but to me, that's stuff that they say say all the time like he's probably heard that from Devin Booker millions of times Devin Booker can say that to any player and any defender in the world so I think they're cool I think they're friends and I think you know Jay Crowder has been beloved in that locker room so when I saw it you know all the all the tweets that I saw about them exchanging words did not match what I knew about the situation what I saw in film classic Twitter <laughs> Chandler classic there's nothing here this is just you know one-on-one back in the day practice then going at it this this was all friendly and fun and it, it, it to someone that doesn't know or doesn't get it or maybe watching basketball for the first time they would think that was serious but you can clearly see Devin is laughing they're friends off the court like Chom just said Jay has nothing but a great rep uh in this league so there was nothing here but it is fun and that was honestly really really good defense and just better offense yeah, I like watching that moment right there. Um, look, Chandler mentioned it. The Western Conference is all over the place, and no better way to to prove that than this following. Suns are right now, they've lost straight, right? They're fourth, but they're only three games that separate them from the eighth seed. Are you worried, Eddie, about the Suns, especially now without KD as we wind things down? No, because they're <laughs> losing these games without KD. They remain competitive in this game. It's the same for the previous game with the, with the Warriors. They found a way to fight their way into the game. So that's nice to see. But, like, they're lacking 30-point-per-game score who could defend all over the court. And they have one waiting, and he's slowly working his way back onto the court. And, and we'll see him at some point soon. But because of that, I'm not worried. But if they were losing these games with Kevin, yeah, then it'd be like, whoa, this, this is getting kind of kind of dark. But... Uh, you do wonder a little bit about their backup big man situation, but I think, you know, Kevin also helps with that as well. And you, we won't know who this team is until we see Kevin on the court with them, and then we can have our worries after that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, listen, they're missing arguably the best player in the NBA, and that's although that's going to take time and it's going to be a little bit of a process, it's not something you worry about. This is something KD's done this before. You can plug him into any roster right now in the NBA – and it's going to make them monumentally better. But, I mean, listen, they gave up a lot, and and they're currently not seeing the results, but I think that changes as soon as he comes back. He was on the right path. He, they won three straight with them. A fluke injury and layup drills. As soon as KD back, I kind of think they just take off, and they're going to be one of the more dangerous teams. But you definitely got to find ways. Chris Paul has got to be more aggressive. DeAndre Ayton's got to dominate more. And Devin Booker really – Devin Booker has to do what Anthony Davis is doing for the Lakers until KD's back. 
For the record, the soundtrack to today's show is not brought to you by me. Anybody want to tell me who that is? Got the SWAT team outside? Good Lord. The police is coming, uh, for, you. <laughs> the police is coming for you, Eddie. Yeah. Shams is in Chicago. It might be him, man. It, it could be Shams. It could be Shams. I love, I love it every just, day. I love how you know it's just not me if there's police. It's not, it's not. <laughs> I don't know that. You're actually. in the hills. They're not coming up there. They're not coming up there. Uh, all right. This is the bad news part of the show. Lakers set a franchise record 15 <laughs> first half threes. What? In a 123 108 win. Over the Pelicans, AD, there he is, finished with 35 and 17. Malik Beasley had seven threes, 24 points. Look, we're going to do something we probably haven't done in quite some time. I'm going to ask the question, Chandler. How much credit does Rob Palinka deserve for the overhaul that they've done here? I mean, he cleaned up his own his own mess, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> The initial team he put out there had no chance. We could see from the first, you know, three weeks of the season that that team was garbage. They didn't mesh. They had no shooting. They didn't fit personnel wise. And I will give them credit now that they have gotten a lot better, right? They got a lot younger. They got shooting. They got youth. They have, and they also have like a bit of hope for the future. They're not just stuck with these older vet players like they have been the last couple of years. And we talked about it yesterday. Yeah, this is Anthony Davis again, 35 and 17, and, and who's going to step up? And it just happened to be Malik Beasley last night. He goes seven for 12. Three. Austin Reeves goes three for four. Rui uh, Hachimura, he hits two threes. So when you get Anthony Davis, Davis dominating like this, they're going to continue to win games, especially when you get these role players. And it's going to be someone different. It's going to be Troy Brown one night. It's going to be Schroeder one night. It's going to, but these guys have to keep stepping up. But they look really, really good. They look dangerous. Yeah, I mean, exactly what Chandler said. When Anthony Davis is scoring 30 points, to me, the, the, the barometer is 25 points or more for AD. If, the, if he can get to that number and he doesn't have off nights like, the, like he had the other night, he went 8 for 18 the other night, 17 points. They lost. He took all the ownership uh, for, for, for the loss because he can't play that way with no LeBron James in the lineup. So last night, 35, 17. They're 8-1 and one this season when he has 30 points or more along with 15 rebounds or more. So he's been able to put up big numbers uh, in big moments this season. They need him to continue. They need him to stay healthy. He's not playing tonight in, back, in the back-to-back -back tonight. I think there was hope within the Lakers that he'd be able to play back-to-backs in the second half of the season. Him, uh, the, the Lakers doctors, the medical staff, they decided to preserve him in these back-to-back -back moments uh, for the playoffs potentially, hopefully for them. Uh, but right now, all eyes are on AD. They're going to get the help. D'Angelo Russell is playing at a high level. Uh, they're getting. You're, you're going to get one shooter, whether it's Austin Reeves, Malik Beasley. Someone's going to step up on a nightly basis. But to me, it's all about AD. Yeah, you know, I wish I would have remembered he's not playing back to backs before I picked him in our parlay. But I, I, I like this team. I can't help it. I, I like this team. And Laker fans are sharing Instagram posts, and it looks like they actually like each other now. And it makes me what? think of like October, November, where they look like they were just stressed out at every moment on the court. But th th Rob Pelinka deserves a ton of credit because he finally realized, like, hmm, maybe I should put a bunch of shooters around Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Maybe that'll work. And they have space to operate, and they can score a bunch of points, and they can maybe defend a little bit where they have some energy. But it, it, the team just makes sense now, and it did not make sense before with Russell Westbrook. I'm sorry. So now they have they have snipers at every situation, and then they have a night like they had last night. Malik Beasley had five threes in a quarter. I thought he was like Reggie Miller reincarnated. I couldn't believe <laughs> what was happening in front of my eyes. They were up like 40 on the Pelicans. This is a team who's right next Ooh. to them in the standings. Both teams absolutely needed this game. And the Pelicans laid an egg and got smoked. So there's something to be said about camaraderie. There's something to be said about good morale in the locker room. And those guys look like they're having a ball. And that, that matters. It matters on the court. Look at their record since the trade deadline. I I hate to be that guy, and I hate to say it, but clearly they had a little bit of a black cloud in their locker room. They got it out of there. I forget what they said. They called it the vampire or whatever they called it. But they got yeah. something out of that locker room, and they look way happier. They look way better, and it's showing on the court. That bums me out. I hate hearing that. Uh, look, there was a positive moment for Lakers fans as well. Another one. Uh, LeBron, no boot, Shams. Another moment we get to see that. What's the latest? Yeah, he was seen shooting on the court for the first time since his injury. So there's two layers to this, Michelle. On one hand, he is feeling a lot better with that foot. I think LeBron's foot is, is doing much better than it was. It's a tendon injury. Uh, so it was a pretty serious injury that he had. 
On the other hand, um, there's still no concrete timeline for him to get on the court. There's no timeline for him to return to action as of yet. I'm told he's still a ways away. And the Lakers are bracing as if he's going to need most, if, if not all, the remainder of, of the regular season at least uh, to ramp up potentially to come back on the court. But just look at the timing. He's one and a half weeks away from his next reevaluation. There's th about three and a half weeks left in the season. So he's not coming back in a week in a week and a half. It's going to be extended longer than that. So you're pushing you're going to be pushing that three and a half week mark uh, of a potential return. He needs all the time he can get. He needs all the weeks that he can get. Um, so I'm curious from Chandler's perspective, like when you look at the timing, you look at how, you know, he just started getting on the court to shoot free throws. Uh, he's a week and a half away from a reevaluation. There's three weeks plus left in the season. Do you think it's realistic for a comeback? And how would you approach it if you're LeBron James at his age and, and his threshold right now? Yeah, well, there's now a team, if I'm him, that I'm excited to get back. And I'm sitting there watching, and I'm probably chomping at the bit because I want to play with these guys, and I see the potential here, and I see that we do actually have shooting around us, and Anthony Davis is playing again at that high level that he did in the beginning of the season before he got hurt. Uh, and this is a good sign that he's, he's on the court. Um, and, and yeah, they're right there. But I think the biggest thing is obviously he doesn't want to rush back. He's a guy that you can just plug into this roster right now. Once you know a, a game before the play in, and they're going to be a lot better. So yeah, I think I think now there should be some level of urgency because he's got to be excited. He's got to be happy with with what he sees. He's got to enjoy it. But the the issue with me is I can't stand that Anthony Davis isn't playing tonight. Like they're playing the, they didn't play that crazy of minutes last night. They're playing the Rockets. They need this. They need every game. Put a minute restriction on them. Let them dominate the first half and then shut them down. I, I, this is, I, I, they're not, they're in no position to be resting. They're, they're really only player or the star player against the Houston Rockets. If they lose this game tonight, this is this mm. is devastating. So I don't know why they're allowing that. But yes, yeah, seeing him shoot, seeing LeBron possibility coming back, you know, before the actual play in is huge for them and he's only gonna make them better. I, this feels like one of the, I mean, look, I could be so, so wrong, but it feels like one of those things where Anthony Davis could walk in and be like, I want to at least play the first, just let me play the first oh, half, right? Like this doesn't feel as uh, team regulated. It's too it's too rigid. That, that's a weird one for me as well. I agree with you, Chandler. I saw you shaking your head and I was like, you need every game. Um, look, can we talk Denver for a second? Cause what is the deal? with the Denver Nuggets. Somehow, some way, they've lost four straight. Look, Jokic still had 28, eight and seven. Van Vliet though, coming in with the 36 points. Afterwards, Coach Malone said, maybe we've gotten a little soft with success. We've been on cruise control for so long. Number one in the West since like mid-December. I just told our players, we've gotten away from who we are. Chandler, he used the word soft. Has this team gone soft? I mean, they've gone somewhere because this isn't the team that's been <laughs> This isn't the team that's been number one all year long. And you can tell they're, they've gotten a little complacent. They have that kind of cushion in the number one seed. But what's frustrating is they're healthy. Like everybody, everybody played last night. So it's not like you can be like, ah, well, Jamal Murray was out. Ah, Aaron Gore. They are fully loaded. They're not sitting guys. They're not resting guys. And they are trying to win these games. And they are in a real rut here. And everyone knows their defense has been an issue. But they're, 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 they do. They play soft. They don't, they don't play hard. You don't see them diving on the floor. You don't see them scrambling for loose balls or kind of rotating on, on like blitz or they don't really do that. They kind of play at their own tempo. They rely on their offense. They have arguably the best player in the world that kind of controls everything they're doing on that end. But there's some liabilities on the other end. And usually when you when you don't play defense, you get that soft label. And that's the last mm -hmm. thing you want to be labeled. That's the last thing you want your coach saying to the media. So maybe this is a way of sparking them and kind of making them kind of look in the mirror and be like, all right, guys, listen, this is not going to be sweet. Clearly, we just lost four in a row. And this is on the this is not when they need to be going this way. This is the time that they need to be rallying and peaking and getting ready for the postseason to contend for a championship. And they've gone the other way. And you look around the league and you see a lot of other teams that are playing really, really well right now. And that's got to be scary for them. Yeah, I, seen, I had somebody tell me yesterday, the Nuggets are getting everybody's best shot now because they're number one in the West. No, they're not. They, they don't defend. They gave up 50 points in the first quarter last night. That's how you lose games. They were down 20 to start the game. They're not, they're just not giving the effort on that side of the floor. Now, you can make whatever reason you want. Maybe Mike Malone is right. They've got laxadaisical because, look, the season is essentially over for them. They're going to be the one seed 
or they might be the two seed. They keep messing around like this, but it looked like a layup line out there. The Raptors shot 50, 40, 89 as a team. So they almost hit the 50, 40, 90 threshold for the game. And it's not a great shooting team over there, it's, but they were knocking it down. They were in the paint all night. Fred Van Vliet had the time of his life with that, with that being the pick and roll defense for him, Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. And they were just knocking it down. So if you're the Nuggets, you got to be concerned because there's other teams that are picking up steam. The Warriors are picking up steam. We're watching them. They, you see what's going on. You look at the East. You look at the way the Bucks are looking. Like you have to be concerned because they cruise on the one seat all season long, and they're hearing the whispers. They're hearing everybody go, "We got to sit in the playoffs. We got to sit in the playoffs." It's looking like everybody might be right this, this last week because they're just not on point at the time of the season when the best teams in the league are sharpening their tools and they're getting ready. So. Mike Malone's right, and he's trying to rally the troops a little bit, but my, the thing for him is I don't think they have the personnel to just be a good defensive team. He's not going to snap his fingers and like, oh, now we care more, we're working harder, and we're defending. It's not going to happen like that for them. So they have issues, and they're going to they're gonna see their warts on HD for everybody to see when the playoffs start. Um, the MVP thing, look, the Yo Jokic is still the favorite, but the odds have actually come down a bit, and Bede is closing that gap, Chandler. Where are you right now with, between those two? I was just going to say the real winner of this is Joel Embiid. He's sitting there he's got, after a four game skid <laughs> for the Nuggets. Joel Embiid is on ESPN tonight against the Cavs. I look for him to absolutely dominate and explode tonight. And it's tough because again, this is just a, this is a week of the season where Jokic and the Nuggets are exposed a little bit and they're losing the overall foundation of the season is probably still go Jokic, but this is exactly what Embiid needs for him to get the Ooh, nod wow. over him. They need to fall off. The Sixers need to keep winning. Joel has games like tonight where the whole world's watching, where Jokic is at his low of the season. Embiid can make a statement tonight and kind of better those odds. But, it's again, it's tough to go against it. I would put Giannis next to those guys at the way they're playing and how they've dominated, how they've been the clear-cut best team in the NBA right now. I would put Giannis up there too, but if it's between this two, man, it's tough. But this is the best possible scenario for for Joel Embiid. Giannis right now is sitting at three, so you wouldn't be wrong. Although it's it's a bit of a bigger gap. I wonder if psychologically, Jokic not winning the MVP this year would actually be a good thing for the team itself, right? Like just take some I, of that pressure off. I see that. I see that going yesterday on Twitter. I seen people saying, "Hey." I don't think Jokic wants to win MVP now. Yeah, he does. He just had two 30-point triple-doubles back-to-back. They just hoping to lose the game. He wants to win. He wants to get his numbers. He wants to get his stats. Every player wants to get their stats. But th this is how you lose MVPs. You, you know, it's a what-have-you-done-lately-for-me late, league. We're Naturally, as humans, we're going, yo, what do I remember most? Oh, that last month of the season. And this is how you lose MVPs. You, you skid to the finish line like this. And not only do I have Embiid over him right now, I'm with Shams was saying it yesterday. I got I got Giannis over him as well. Best record in the league. Incredible stats. That's how you win MVPs. You you do it just like that. Voter fatigue is over. Why isn't Giannis on the on the Chiron with them as well? I got now Jokic is third in my mind for MVP, and I'm sure wow. I'm not the only person. But this is a good thing. This is what we want from our MVP race every year. We have three absolutely deserving candidates, and we're going to be fighting over it till April 9th, the last day of the season, figuring out who should be this, who should win this award. And that's great. That's great for the league. Yeah, it is you know, great. It's an actual you know close race. Our, oh, sorry, Chandler. You know, you know what's crazy is we're talking about how, you know, he's fallen off. He had 28, 8, and 7, 10 yeah. for 13 for the field, and 8 for 8 from the free throw line. The guy is still unbelievable, but it's like the talent and the other guys have been so good, too. This is the way you would dock Jokic if you're looking at MVP voting. Ah, well, the best player, the best team all year long, they wouldn't allow their team to lose four straight. They wouldn't be in this mm -hmm. kind of funk right now towards the end of the season. So this is the only way that we can lower Jokic is by his team losing because he's – he's still going to put up ridiculous numbers no matter what if they win or lose yep that's going to be the narrative whether that nuggets team can do anything come playoff time shams this is part where we we bid you adieu for the rest of the week as it is wednesday and we will see you right and early on monday we also will take a break right now um and then when we come back pg pg had a lot to say about two-way players and himself when run it back returns run it back run it over run it back yeah yeah run it over run it back run it over 
now, but your New York Knicks are doing things. Beating the Blazers, 123-107. Quickly, Randall, Barrett, they all combined for 72. Dame did have 38-7-7 in the loss, but, I mean, the Knicks are 11 games over 500. They're sitting in the fifth spot. Chandler, do you believe this Knicks team could be dangerous come playoffs? I think they can be dangerous enough to get out of the first round. I do. And I said yesterday when these guys, Barrett, Randall, Brunson, when two of those three have 30 points and you have quickly doing what he does and Grimes is making shots, they are a dangerous team. But it, again, we talk about it all the time. The East is just too stacked. The Philly 76ers, the Celtics, the Bucks, they're all a, such a wide gap in between them of talent and of potential that I think it comes to an end if, if they draw the Cavs in the first round, which I think is everyone would want, and that would be the most competitive series. I think the Knicks could get that done, but I still think it would be a dogfight. But listen, this has been a great season. The NBA is great for the for when the Knicks are good. This is great for the fan base. This is great for free agency coming up this this uh, you know this summer to pair a, a star with you know whichever who they keep of that big three. They're in a great position. They've had a great year. I, even if they lose first round to the Cavs, I still think this is a successful season and they build off this because it's not like they're old. It's not like they're going anywhere. They have a good future. They have a good foundational, you know, young core moving forward so do i think they're a contender now not even close but they are a very fun team that's on the rise yeah i'm with chandler you know depending on how the next three week three weeks shake up they could have the six they could have the sixers celtics or Cavs, and obviously they want the Cavs out there matchup not that that's not a great team as well but you just gotta like that matchup a little bit better uh but yeah it's been a great season they've kind of revived what they have going on there and they have a lot to look forward to with Jalen Brunson. I think R.J. Barrett, is as much as they like him, he's also really tradable. So there's a lot they can do there. They still have all their picks. Uh, they're in a great spot. And, it, you know, even what, what the Nets are doing, they're in a great spot over there. The Knicks, it's the Knicks town. And, and they're owning it now. And, and they're right above them in the standings as well. So they can look back on this season and say success, even if they end up losing in the first round to the Cavs or the Sixers. But if it's Cavs, yo, they wouldn't surprise me if they won. It's, it's going to be a big series for Jalen Brunson. Hopefully he's healthy and back in time for that. And we get both teams at full strength to see who really wins there. I mean, the Knicks have beaten Boston a few times. I feel like they wouldn't necessarily be terrified of that. But I get it. Playoffs, playoffs, playoffs. Um, can we talk a little bit about Mitchell Robinson? He, he posted on Snapchat. I still don't really get Snapchat, but I'm old. So it, this is what it was. Tired as F of just being out there for cardio, fam. Like, I want to play <laughs> basketball, really wasting my time and energy. He did have two points in 21 minutes, but he also does a lot of other things out there, so I'm a little confused by it, Chandler. Is there any upside when you post things like this? Zero. Absolutely <laughs> zero. And this is, a sign of, this is a sign of immaturity. This is selfish. This is him being a bad teammate. His, his team is finally on top. They're having a great year. They haven't done anything with him there. Now they're finally getting a taste of success, and you just provide this public distraction, really. And, le and let's be honest, I, big guys like this, when they go on this rant, uh, what, what do you want, the ball? You want isos? He has zero game. He can't go and score. He's not like he's going to go get buckets, so I don't really know where he's getting at. He's a great big man that can roll, that can run, mm. that can block shots, that can help defensive, uh, uh, you know, catalyst of a defensive good team. But he will get exposed if they give him a ball. If they, if they run him a play, he's he's not that guy. And I think the 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 more he grows up, the older he gets, he'll realize that. But this is you're picking the wrong battle here because I think if they did do that, he would honestly just it would end poorly for him. And his role is to run, to go you know basket to basket, catch lobs, get offensive rebounds, and impact the game that way. And he'll make a hundred million dollars, a hundred fifty million dollars doing that. You start giving him the ball on the post and all this riffraff, <laughs> it's going to be a long season and a short career for him. So this is this is this is pretty ignorant. Yeah, I feel like he's <laughs> under or undervaluing what he can do, and it kind of bums me out a little bit. Um, I do want to before we stop talking about Portland for a second. They we want to introduce something here. We're not a hundred or thousand percent sure even that this is real, but in my heart, I want it to be real. So I'd like to introduce everyone to the new Trailblazers mascot. Mr. Douglas Fur. Oh. <laughs> Does anybody have any comments they'd like to share? 
This is probably what Dame is, uh, this is what Dame is talking about, where he can't stand where the MVP is going. <laughs> I don't get it. It's like a flannel corset. I don't. I don't. His face is terrifying. Yeah, but okay. Thanks. No, this is this is <laughs> let's let's just do away with mat. Like we have enough mascots. We don't we don't need new mascots. Well, so, hey, but they need one, right? Like, thing. what if if your team doesn't have one? Don't you technically need a mascot? <laughs> Science. It's fine. Just play music. Oh play music my at the God. commercial breaks and and have dancers and do all that. We we don't need this guy. We don't need. Like, what is this? Oh. Is this Bigfoot? I I don't. Did this you guys is, ever see Harry and the this Hendersons? A it's a terrible I mean, you're young. Break. Yes. Have, yeah, it's like a cheap I, version of Harry. <laughs> I didn't want to age myself, but thank you. You, you did it I for I will us. always age myself for you, Eddie. Do not even <laughs> worry about that. Chandler's just like, hoo Okay. <laughs> Harry and the Hendersons. It's just a classic John Lithgow movie. Whatever. Harry um, and the Spy? What? <laughs> what? No. Harry and the Spy? No, Harry yeah. and the Hendersons. The Bigfoot um, finds the family. <laughs> oh. It's classic. Uh, you mentioned Damian Lillard, by the way, uh, when what some things that he might have said. And he did. He said some things on the J.J. Reddick podcast. Let's take a listen. While I understand we play to win championships, we all want to win the championship. We can't keep acting like nothing matters, like the rest of the stuff. The journey doesn't matter. We can't keep doing that. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like, there are so many ways that the league is different. There are so many ways, and I, I think about it all the time, where I'm like, man, I just don't, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm, if I can just play a long, long time because I don't, I don't enjoy what, what the NBA as a whole is becoming. Man, J.J. Reddick's doing the Bryant Gumbel where he just writes while the guy's talking. I love it. All right, so it's you buying that time, Eddie. You buying that, 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 Dame's right about ring culture in the league. He was talking about a little bit more than ring culture. He, he actually got it like the youth of the league, too. And, and <laughs> look, we all reach our mid-30s and become our uncles, and we're just grumpy on the porch complaining. But I do buy what he's saying, and I, I, I do get his overall point where – he talks about later, like, yo, I live a great life. I, after after basketball, I go home, I have a whole life. I have friends that don't play basketball. I, I have this whole situation outside of, like, the three hours you see me. And I get what he's saying. And, and we're in a world now with social media where we can view athletes as more than jerseys in the back of cards with numbers and stuff. And, and that's basically what Dan's getting at because he's lived that life. He's understood that. I think people will take this as, like, anti-ring culture from a guy without a ring, but like ring culture is toxic too. Like you can have a successful season and not win a ring. The Oklahoma City Thunder are elated with the season they've had and they're not gonna sniff a ring. So it's like we've, we've in, in social media, we just turned it into these arguments and these baseless debates about who's the best and, and that's what we go to. We go to like this person has rings, this person this. And so he's right, I'm with him. I, I think it's might be right message, wrong messenger because people are gonna immediately say, well, of course you don't care about rings. You don't have none, but he makes a great point. I'm curious about Chandler, too, because he's he's lived that. He's lived that, like, yo, I leave the locker room, and now I go back to regular life, and people think of me as a contract and all this stuff. So I know you had to hit hard this and like, yo, he's cooking. He's potting right now. I, I do. I think winning a championship and having a ring is the most watered down stat or, you know, you could have, let's say, let's say Dame right before the deadline, he got traded to Milwaukee or, and he wins a ring this year. All of a sudden that makes him a better player than he already is. Or, you know, Blake Griffin's on the cusp of winning a, a, a being a, in the hall of fame, right? He wins a ring this year in Boston that just he's now an NBA champion. So he's now a Hall of Famer, even though he did really nothing for the Celtics all season long. Like, I don't understand that. Like Zaza Pachulia, he gets all these rings <sighs> and careers, but then so teams want him to bring that championship, ex championship experience and culture to the locker room. It's like that's where it gets watered down because anybody could get a championship like Damian Jones, I think has three rings. I don't even, I don't know where he's playing right now. So like it is, it's, it's what you play for. It's what you want. And it is not even, I'm not even going at those guys that, you know, that I just mentioned because it's just, it's part of it. And it's part of it. where like, uh, that's why you see guys at the end of their career that they have all the stats, they have the resume. All they need is a ring. Blake's a perfect example. 
icing on the uh, cherry on top. If they, if the Celtics won a championship this year, I think Blake is a, is going to the hall of fame without that. It's like, it's kind of up and down. Is he, is he not? But even though he didn't really play a lot this year, so it, it is weird and it is watered down because uh, I could right now go sign for the rest of the season on the Bucks and win a championship this year. And on my on my Wikipedia, I'm an NBA champion with doing nothing <laughs> all year long. It's, it's 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 a little lame to me. And I I respect Dame for staying there and not making it about that. But it, it is nice. Obviously, that is what you play for. That is what you go to camp early for. That is what you grind for. That's what you watch film and, and do all the workouts for. But it is just like when you're look, talking about who's better. Well, this guy's got this many rings. That guy like. It's silly. Like it's 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 a silly argument. Better career, well, better somewhere player, maybe. Better career and player is is sure. Yeah. Like Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce has a championship. I think Tracy McGrady was better at basketball than him, but he doesn't have a championship. You know what I mean? So it's it's two different art. It's two different arguments. Yeah. Somewhere along the lines, we forgot this is a team sport, and not only is it team sport, <laughs> it's like the consummate team sport. You you can't win without great teammates. I've seen this argument all the time. It's like yo. Uh, this person did it all. They backpacked this team. They carried. No, you, everybody who's won a championship, they had great teammates next to them. They had a great coach. They had a great organization. You, you, it's not an individual award. The championship ring is not an individual. They give them to all 15 guys. They give them to the coaches. They give them to the owner. They give them to the GM. They give them, uh, teams and organizations win championships, but somehow we've whittled it down like it's tennis and said, yo, this guy is better than that guy because that guy has one and that guy has zero. Just like you just said. Most people think Tracy McGrady is better than Paul Pierce. All due respect to Paul Pierce. But, like, the, if you're arguing Paul Pierce, that's, you're starting your argument, well, well, Paul Pierce won a title. Do you not think the Celtics would have been great with prime Tracy McGrady there as well? Like, what are you saying? And then you bring up, like, Robert Ory has this many, and, mm -hmm. and then you're talking about superstars. Like, so is Robert Ory better than Carmelo Anthony? Like, what are we, what are we doing here at some point? So when we strip away all the nuance and context of the conversation and we turn the NBA Finals – into a one-on-one -on -one contest, now that's what was ruining the sport and the conversation around the sport. And I think Dame's right. It's really damaging the way we view the sport, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Well, this is a great time to take a break because when we come back, what we're going to do is exactly sort of what you guys um, – we're talking about we're gonna we're gonna get a list of players we're gonna rank them but it's all according to paul george <laughs> so we're not in trouble on this one that when run it back returns and for the record we don't mention zaza patchouli in my presence ever again thank you Welcome back. We are uh, we're talking a little Paul George here. Learned yesterday he had a podcast. Didn't know that. Uh, had a list of the top two way players in NBA history. His list included self, Gary Payton, Kevin Garnett, Hakeem Olajuwon, and one Michael Jordan. Chandler, how do you feel about this list? If I'm his teammate sitting next to him, I'm probably like, where am I on this list? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm arguably better offensively and defensively. Uh, I love Paul George. He's honestly one of my favorite players. I love the way he plays. This is tough. He, he's he's not naming LeBron. He's not naming Kevin Durant. He's not naming Scottie Pippen. Uh, and then it's funny. I was just looking up, you know, best centers because the Lodge one's a good one. Dwight Howard. It's funny that we were just talking about. It. It's all the eight-time All-Star, five-time All-NBA, three-time Defensive hmm. Player of the Year, five-time All-Defensive First Team. You know what the first thing on his Wikipedia is? What? It, NBA champion. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious that just happened because he's got one of the craziest resumes I've ever seen, and he won the 2020 <laughs> championship with the Lakers, and that's the first thing in bold. So that's weird. I was, I was just talking about it, but yeah, listen, all those guys are great two-way players, but I could probably name you know five other ones that would beat that team. But I, I feel them; those are all really good players. Hmm. Shout out to Paul. Podcast P, I think is what his podcast is called. Listen to the show. I'm all for, like, the player with his buddy having a show. I, I love it. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, the guy who played in that same gym, he's playing it now. Kobe Bryant. Like, where is he at on this list? I, I get what he's saying. He values himself as a two-way player, and he's right. He is one of the better two-way players in the last decade. But, yeah, Kawhi, uh, Kobe, LeBron. There's a lot of guys who could be on this list. Without him, love PG, but just two weeks ago he was telling us he's not the number one guy on the title team. So let's put all those guys first and then put him after that as well. Uh, great player, Hall of Famer. I like the pod. 
But uh, yeah, let's. Uh, this is kind of like the Chappelle skit where you get to write and direct your biography. I'd put myself top five all the time yeah. too if I was writing the story. But uh, I, I don't have him in my top five. Great, great guy, great player. I feel like if he would have gone top twenty, uh, maybe it wouldn't have such as much kick, but it would probably be a little bit easier to swallow as a whole list. I would imagine. Um, but I get it. You got to vote for yourself, or who else will? So. James Wiseman. I know we want to touch on this yesterday, but James Wiseman right now averaging 16 and a half points, 10 rebounds, about a block and a half a game. Uh, this was a big story, right? Like, was he going to be the second, the new generation of Warriors? Do we think perhaps, Eddie, that Golden State might have given up on him just a bit too soon? Yeah, when you when you trade away a number two overall pick before his contract's up and he's healthy, yeah, you, you've probably given up on him too soon. I, I get what happened, and, and to essentially trade him away for Gary Payton II, a, a, a guy you had in your locker room, a, a second-round pick that you had, a guy you could have signed with your own money earlier. Uh, yeah, it is a weird pick looking, it is a weird move looking back. That's a lot of talent right there with James Wiseman. He was number one, uh, number one ranked player for his entire high school career, essentially. But he just didn't fit what they were doing, so they had to move on. The Warriors operate kind of like a football team. We have our system, and you're either going to set screens and, and rebound and defend for Steph. You're going to be Kevin Looney, or you're going to be a Detroit <laughs> Piston. And uh, he's not Kevin Looney, so he's a Detroit Piston. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think, listen, this guy's 21 years old. He's seven foot. He's athletic. He's mobile. He. This is a perfect situation for him, right, because now he's on a, a not-so-good team. He's getting the reps. He's getting the minutes. He didn't really necessarily have this opportunity in Golden State, and for whatever reason – he was in the doghouse for most of his time there. I did think it was going to be a perfect fit with all the shooting, with all that offense, and he was going to be able to come in and kind of roll, be that lob threat guy, and he wasn't. But, yeah, with, with this age and this athleticism and your team as the Warriors, too, it's an older team, and I know they're win now. And But like Eddie said, they got Gary Payton for this guy, basically. So, like, th that's not getting a lot in return for a kid who hasn't even scratched the surface. So, I'm all I'm all on it, and I hope it works out for him. It's just a classic case where I hope this guy turns into a perennial all-star and dominates because it didn't work, and this is all situational, right? There's a lot of guys that just were drafted or were traded or signed with the wrong situation, and they're in Europe or they're in Asia playing. I hope that doesn't happen to him. I hope he finds a home because he's he's got a lot of potential, and he was supposed to be really good. I'm going to take a quick break here. Our parlay last night did not go exactly as we had planned, uh, but that's all right because we're stupid enough to try again when Run It Back returns. <laughs> Take a shot on college hoops with an assist from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. New customers, bet the bracket and get 10 times your first bet in bonus bets. That's up to $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. With FanDuel, you can bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to which team will score first. So join today and get up to $200 in bonus bets when you place your first bet guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Well, I guess the good thing is we were as a team last night lousy okay none of us got a single one of those things right and maybe we just want to see those big fat red w's or l's i guess before we move on to tonight's but yeah we are um we're not really reaching our stride at the end of the season guys this is worrisome that's wow. yeah. i want to take together. a victory lap what i want to take a victory lap because the nuggets and pelicans both lost by 15 points the nets only yeah, lost brutal. by 14. Okay, that's not how this so. works. That is, no. No, nope, not how it works. Have, uh, Michelle, you had the Lakers, right? And then you switched last second? Yes. Yes, Chandler. Thank you so much for remembering that one instinct, dumb detail. Is correct. <laughs> Shut up. All right, let's do tonight. Good Lord. At least it's Wednesday. We don't have to know until Monday. Go ahead, Eddie. I got the Here Lakers, go. uh, even with the points. The Rockets aren't winning twice in a week. Let's be serious. Uh, even with Anthony Davis sitting. D-Lo show tonight. I'm going Lakers. I don't know about that. Chandler? <laughs> I am going Bulls. I thought it was in Chicago. I hope it's in Chicago. Just I feel like they're going to rally at home tonight and uh, test. It is in Chicago. <laughs> that it makes is, all yeah. the difference. Uh, I'm taking the Cavs plus two and a half against the – I don't know why I did that. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I really have good feelings about any of this. Uh, 20 bucks will win you about $117. They're going this to take us off of these at some point. What? 
Y'all might get yours. Um, all right, that does it for us. It is Wednesday, which is our Friday, which means we won't see you again until Monday morning, 10 Eastern. Chandler, big plans? I'm going to Cabo, so I'll be doing the show from Cabo. Oh, my Monday God. Monday. Who are you? It's like Tony Stark. All right, fine. We'll see you guys Monday morning. Right. <laughs>